I'm continuing with the best of the rest of this week time with a big batch of action games. Shooters, brawlers, and a whole bunch of other fun stuff. So, let's get started. Well, Wolf Child is 90s at a level comparable with Excalibur 2097, but it's also not as good. The controls are decent enough, and the level design has some elements to it, but it's not as fun. The game has limited continues, which has been mentioned previously as one of my pet peeves, and the checkpointing is really rough. As an example, in the first level, the checkpoint between the first boss isn't at the boss itself, it's at the mini-boss right before the boss. So, if you die, it's not a case where you come back in with the boss with full health and resources, and more in front of another smaller boss fight which will drain your resources before you get into the much more complicated and difficult actual boss fight. Not surprisingly, considering that this is from Core Design, this is a port of a Commodore Amiga game. I hope that that game holds up better than the Super Nintendo version does, so someone who's more familiar with that version of the game will have to speak for it. Continuing with the Amiga ports is First Samurai, something of an action platformer that isn't a particularly intuitive game, especially if you don't have the manual. The controls are kind of rough, and it's not entirely clear what each level's objectives are, if, again, you don't have the manual. And the premise feels a little appropriative. It's a game from a bunch of British people that is ostensibly about samurai, but only has as much to do with actual samurai as the film Samurai Cop does. It, it's not particularly a good game, and I don't feel the inclination to play more of it, between the controls, the level environments, and everything else. Supernova is the US version of Darius Force, and it's punishingly hard. It demands lightning reflexes and precise memorization of the game's levels. If you don't have the reflexes and you can't get the game's levels down, you're kind of screwed. I thought the game isn't fun by any means, it's that it will absolutely kick your butt repeatedly with the malice and forethought from the first level and on easy. However, the game also has limited continues, which puts a bad taste on the game's difficulty. If it had unlimited continues, I'd feel better with this because you have chances to learn and pick up the reflexes and pick up the patterns, particularly once you get past the first level and into the later levels, which are presumably even harder than the first level is. Now there's a Game Genie code for unlimited lives, but considering that the game has a variety of ships that each have different types of weapons and different upgrade paths, I'd prefer one for unlimited continues instead. So you'd have an opportunity to change ships if you found that your current ship didn't fit your playstyle or the current level of the game. Sunset Riders is a very good port of a quarter muncher arcade game. The graphics, while certainly inferior to the arcade version, are very good with generally solid controls and a very fast frame rate. That said, the game is especially unforgiving and retains the fact that the original arcade game was designed to each of quarters. And that's combined with limited continues, which is again kind of a, makes it a little rough to recommend here. Next is Sengoku, which was featured in the uh, Now Playing column, but did not actually receive a US release, but it did come out in Japan. Now, aside from some narrative text, Sengoku is perfectly playable. It's a beam up with solid controls, some really interesting game mechanics, with your ability the character having the ability to shift between multiple forms while making their way through the game, with each form having different attacks and animations and that sort of thing as well. Some characters having a ranged attack, some characters are able to do damage by jumping into opponents, and other similar things. And the game has a really strong and interesting visual style, as you shift between different worlds with different looking feels to them, one a post-apocalyptic wasteland, one a more fantastic environment, that sort of thing. Best of all, this game has unlimited continues, making for the best of all worlds. It's even remarkably affordable if you're up to playing import games. Alien vs. Predator for the Game Boy is a title that wants to structure itself like a Metroidvania, but doesn't even remotely understand how that genre of game works. It has a mini-map like a Metroidvania, along with areas of the map that are gated based on weapons and utility items that you find. But it also has attacks that are barely effective and enemies that seem to exist only for cheap hits. For example, you can see the eggs that the facehuggers burst out of in advance. You know that the uh, the facehugger attacks are coming if you approach those eggs. But you can't avoid them, particularly with how lo low the jumps are in terms of actual physical height-wise. 
and the fact that the eggs are invincible to attack, something that was not an issue in Alien 3 on the Super Nintendo. You can attack eggs, you can destroy them, and that sort of thing. Here, you approach the eggs, you can't do damage to them in advance, the face hacker comes out and attacks you and does ongoing damage for a period of time. And there's nothing you can do about it. Additionally, as with other numerous action games that I've encountered thus far for the Game Boy, the field of view of the game is too restrictive. The game tries to make up for this through the use of letting you scroll the camera up or down by holding the appropriate directional button, but when part of what you need to do is see further forward, you still have a problem. And scrolling up doesn't help you too much because the jump has no height to it. So thus scrolling up is not exactly as effective an option. So this title is a mess and I recommend giving it a miss. We have our second unreleased US title this time with Undercover Cops. This was featured in the Now Playing column, but again, it never received a US release. It did come out in Japan though. Undercover Cops is almost a great brawler, but one that has some dramatic issues. We have enemies, particularly mid-bosses, who are incredibly hard to hit, and who are frequently attacking the protagonist, successfully, I should add, from off-screen. Hell, we have the player having to contend with enemies attacking off-screen in general. We also have limited continues combined with that, and a two-player option in the arcades, but a single-player option only at home. So, what we have basically are much limited gameplay options, a lot of cheap hits and stuff to reduce your enjoyment of the game experience, but are there any points in favor? Sort of. You have very fluid sprites, very rapid movement in the game, and lots of little bits of great flair to the game's characters, such as the, char the player hoisting up massive concrete posts out of the ground to use as a weapon, or saving cute animals to regain health. With some balance tweaks and some adjustments to, you know, the enemies attacking out from off-screen, this would be a fantastic brawler, but as it stands, I just can't recommend it. Next is Lethal Enforcers, a light gun game which, at the very least, has some support for the controller, though that's not really an optimal way to play it. The D-pad control is a little oversensitive, with very little in terms of options in the game to let you calibrate the controller's movement to provide the appropriate amount for you being able to line up good shots. I tried the game out in the emulator with a light gun mode, and I admit that using the mouse in this regard allows for a degree of accuracy that I might not be able to achieve with a regular light gun. However, even then, I found it rather difficult to make it through multiple stages without running out of continues, and again, this is a home port of an arcade game. It should have unlimited continues, because if you had the arcade machine at home, you could set it to free play. I do appreciate, though, that you can get additional continues if you enter a variant of the Konami code while paused, so that option is there. Still, this is a good arcade board that goes more or less straight across without any major consideration to the fact that you're not in the arcade anymore. Next we have Legend, which feels like a Super Nintendo clone of Golden Axe, but with a lot less flavor, and some of the more arcadey elements removed. And that's not necessarily the arcadey elements that are the detrimental ones. Continues in the game don't let you pick up where you left off, which most most of these direct straight across brawler ports do. You you die, you hit continue, and you start exactly where you were when you used up your last life. Here you continue, you start from the beginning of the level. There's also only one character here, as opposed to having different characters with different play styles, which give you options for how you play the game. Here there's just one character, and the second player, though the game does support two players, only has a palette swap. Getting additional potions from beating up enemies and picking them up off the ground gets you more castings of a spell, but not a more powerful casting of a spell, like with Golden Axe. And just a kind of but insult to injury, there's no beast writing. Also, the difficulty is slightly absurd. The game is set to easy by default, and even then, I had some real difficulty completing the game's first level. It's actually kind of disappointing. Wrapping up this episode, we have Pirates of Dark Water, the one licensed title this episode. Well, aside from the Alien vs. Predator one, this is the one licensed title based off a TV show or film. 
It's a bra- and well, this is a brawler based on the Hanna Barbera animated series that was sadly cancelled before hitting twenty four episodes and was never able to finish up its plot arc. This game is a fairly straightforward brawler with one player and two player options, and even the option to have it set up so that the players can do damage to each other. And the players are given the choice of basically three per- the three protagonists for the show, which fit in the final fight idiom of light and fast, right in the middle, and heavy but slow. It's a decent enough brawler, though it has a few issues with balance, and it has platforming in a few levels, which is always kind of rough when you're dealing with this perspective. And once again, we have a, have a limited amount of continues on a game that never saw an arcade release, so there's that bit of frustration there. It's, it's obnoxious because this is clearly something that was done to try and undermine the rental scene, to make it so you couldn't beat the game just with a rental, which is disappointing because it means that these games hold up less well when looked at in the larger perspective of, okay, this isn't actively in rental stores or even branded new on store shelves anymore, just how does it hold up as a game? Additionally, the game also now is actually pretty expensive. And sadly, Pirates of Dark Water itself has been mostly forgotten as, well, it never finished its plot. It was only really available for reruns for a very long time on Cartoon Network, and unlike, say, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, it never received a revival in the early 2000s. And, which is, this is a shame, because this is a show that could stand a revival of that stripe with the narrative tone of something like, say, well, the modern revival of Voltron, or the modern um, sort of Avatar The Last Airbender, Legend of Korra sort of universe of series. I put a lot of thought into my pick for this installment, and after much consideration, I'm going with Sunset Riders. That game, while very brutal with its difficulty, is a lot of fun, and provides a lot of the same run-and-gun action that made Contra work, but with an old Old West environment. It does have a limited number of continues, and there are ways to kind of fudge that using second player controller and that sort of thing. Maybe a little fiddling with uh, cheat devices like Pro Action Replay and Game Genie. But it works a bit more for me compared to some of the other games in terms of how it actually plays. So I'm making that my pick. Next time, we're going a whole slew of... strategy games, and RPGs that didn't make the cut into Nintendo Power, at least thus far. We'll see you then. Ride em, cowboy! much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, talk to me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 